Welcome to the panel, Does American Democracy Presume Racial Justice? I'm really delighted, uh, I don't want to embarrass him, but I'm really delighted today to introduce Kendall Thomas, who is the Nash Professor of Law at Columbia University, director of its Center for the Study of Law and Culture. His teaching and research interests straddle the fields of human rights law, constitutional law, critical race theory, law and sexuality, and law and culture. Among his recent projects are essays on the cultural politics of death penalty abolition activism, on the intellectual and political prehistory of critical race theory and human rights, that is W-R-I-T-E-S, a performance installation work he created with the great choreographer William Forsyth on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which has been staged at the International Theater Festival in Istanbul and at the Palais des Nations in Geneva. I'm also pleased because some 25 years ago, I read, you know those essays that change your life, that rock your foundations? You read them and you can never exactly proceed the same way that you had before. My voice is shaken because Kendall Thomas wrote one of those essays for me and for my peers when I was in graduate school at Princeton University. So I'm really particularly delighted to be the chair of this panel. Um, I also read an essay very recently by Professor Thomas that was on something called Inhuman Rights, a very fascinating work that may be in the process of changing yet again everything that I understood in the world. So um, thank you twice over. Um, it's a delight to be able to join him on this stage. And it's a privilege, actually, to have as the commenter for today's discussion, Jim Sleeper, who has already been introduced. But I want to do a little bit more of a thorough job of it because I want you to make sure that if you want to buy his books or read his articles, you know exactly what they are. So let me say that Jim Sleeper, Jim Sleeper identifies himself as a writer on American civic culture and politics and a lecturer in political science at Yale. He is the author of The Closest of Strangers, Liberalism and the Politics of Race in New York, and Liberal Racism, as well as editor or contributor of several anthologies. His quote-unquote civic Republican philosophy has made him a critic of both left liberal racial identity politics and of neoconservative national security state politics. Um, his reportage and commentary, sampled extensively at www.jimsleeper.com, have appeared in Harper's, The New Republic, The Nation, The New Yorker, The Washington Monthly, Dissent, Commonweal, Democracy Journal, and many other publications. He blogs frequently for Huffington Post, as many of you probably know, The Washington Monthly, and other publications. I'm going to stop there in, um, in order for us to get right to this uh, important discussion. Uh, Professor Thomas is going to speak for about 30 minutes to us, and then we'll have a comment, uh, or, or the questioning at least will be opened up by Professor Sleeper, and then I'm going to open up the questions to the audience. I urge you to uh, not only bring your own experiences and questions and studies uh, into this conversation, but to be really attentive to the dialogue that takes place between our speakers. This is a very unique opportunity. When I think of barred public culture broadly, there's a liberal public culture that I think neither one of these speakers perfectly represents. So it's a great opportunity for us to think closely about things that sound familiar to us, but analytically are in front fact, slightly left or above or around or to the right of what we are familiar with. So please join me in welcoming these two fantastic speakers. Thank you, Professor Ewing. And I'd like to thank Roger Berkowitz and the folks at the Arendt Center for having me here. Um, today, I'm going to try to perch my water bottle, and I'll, I'll reach for it as I need to. Uh, I had originally thought I would present some informal remarks, but the occasion, as I have observed uh, the discussion today, seems to me to call for something a bit more formal. Um, and I'm thinking of what I'm about to say to you as a kind of prolegomenon to the discussion that uh, we're going to have today about the question that frames the panel, namely whether American democracy presumes racial justice. Uh, but 
what I wanted to present to you today was some thoughts that seemed to me uh, to set the terms and to uh, paint a picture or draw a landscape. That's a figure that I like a lot and will be using in the talk of the current moment, um, of our situation, um, of the circumstances in which we find ourselves in America today. Because I think it's uh, first important to take a measure of where we are before we can ask and try to answer uh, this important uh, but difficult question, does American democracy presume racial justice? So I'm going to do that. Uh, in 1913, just after the election that put Woodrow Wilson in the White House, the Crisis Magazine, the house organ of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, published an open letter to the new president by its editor, W.E.B. Du Bois who had supported the Democratic candidate. Du Bois argued that Woodrow Wilson's victory, secured in part by the black vote, presented an historic opportunity. As the first Southerner to occupy the White House since Andrew Johnson, wrote Du Bois, Wilson was uniquely positioned to forge a just and righteous solution to the burning human wrong of what Du Bois called the Negro problem, which was in many respects the greatest problem facing the nation. Although Du Bois lamented Wilson's peculiar lack of personal acquaintance with individual black men, he didn't see this as a handicap, um, or to the extent it was a handicap, he didn't see it as an insoluble problem. For Du Bois, the Negro problem could and would remain insoluble only so long as men insist on settling it wrong by asking absolutely contradictory things. And then he went on to offer this image. You cannot make 10 million people at one and the same time, servile and dignified, docile and self-reliant, servants and independent leaders, segregated and yet part of the industrial organism, disfranchised and citizens of a democracy, ignorant and intelligent. This is impossible. And the impossibility is not factitious. It is in the very nature of things. Du Bois famously described the contradictory racial politics of his time as a problem of the color line laid down by the powers that be and challenged by anti-racist movements of the time that sought to redraw or erase that line. But he also clearly saw that the terms of political discourse in America were tools of racial governance and control that had ensnared black Americans in a kind of color bind. Du Bois poignantly depicts the impossible situation his generation faced as a race war, raged with simultaneous opposite words and ideas, servile, dignified, docile, self-reliant, ignorant, intelligent, leader, servant, citizen, disenfranchised, injustice and inequality for Du Bois were secreted in and through the interstices of the political language white Americans used to talk about black rights. Now, a full century later, we live in a radically different political world than Du Bois wrote about in his letter to Wilson. We live, for example, um, in an era in which a black man has occupied the White House for the last five plus years. And yet, the picture he paints of a black America trying to navigate a minefield of absolutely contradictory things is remarkably redolent of today's political landscape. The American political imagination prides itself on the figure of a black commander in chief, even as it continues to be haunted by the specter of an army of dangerous, hoodie wearing, thuggish black criminals intent on invading the security of gated communities. In short, Du Bois' image of US racial politics as a tangled web of simultaneous opposite words and opposing ideas, identities and ideologies could just as well be used to describe the politics of racial language and the language of racial politics in the age of Obama. Now, in calling the present political moment the age of Obama, I'm not referring to the individual person of Barack Obama. I wanna be quite emphatic about that. Although I will say something here about the brand of personality politics he has come to represent and which I think is a symptom of racial politics in our time. For me, the age of Obama is shorthand for the habits of political thought and practice 
that Mr. Obama embodies, and more spe specifically, the strategic role these habits have played in advancing the agenda of racial neoliberalism, which is my principal concern here. Now, one of the most intriguing and troubling things about American political culture in the post-civil rights era is the extent to which it increasingly tolerates and even encourages a racial word politics, to use a term coined by Thomas Frank and Edward Wiesband, a way of talking about race that can best be described as talking out of both sides of your mouth about race and racism. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, <clears throat> from a speech by Mr. Obama, who has been recognized uh, in many regards as a master orator. The basic terms of Mr. Obama's engagement with the question of race were previewed in a 2008 campaign speech at Philadelphia's Convention Center after he was forced to address the controversy surrounding his former pastor, the Reverend Jeremiah Wright. In a more perfect union, popularly known as the race speech, then Senator Obama connected the politics of race in America to the broader narrative, or a broader narrative, of liberal multicultural nationalism, the strategy he used so effectively during his 2004 keynote address to the Democratic National Convention. The Constitution Center speech was a masterful, masterful performance that changed the political dynamic of the presidential race and shifted the terms of the debate um, of a debate, rather, that the Obama campaign had so clearly hoped to avoid, a debate about race in America. Mr. Obama took care to frame his arguments about the complexity of race in this country, that's his phrase, in balanced and even-handed terms. Throughout the speech, Mr. Obama held black anger and white resentment in a kind of rhetorical equipoise, parsing equal blame and displaying equal empathy on both sides or for both sides of the racial divide. He decried the racial stalemate in which the country had been mired for years and lamented the chasm of misunderstanding between the races that has blocked America's progress on the path to a more perfect union. Mr. Obama emphatically rejected the notion that white racism is endemic to America. To make the case against the view that racial injustice and inequality are integral permanent features of our national identity, Mr. Obama offered his own life story as an exhibit in chief. I am the son, he said, of a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas. He then fused the personal and political in a startling turn of phrase. My story, said Mr. Obama, has seared into my genetic makeup. The idea that this nation is more than the sum of its parts, that out of many, we are truly one. Since his election to the presidency, Mr. Obama's remarks on the topic of race have for the most part hewed to the we have different stories but common hopes language of racial liberalism, or I might say of a kind of fusion of racial liberalism and racial multiculturalism that served him so well in 2004, in 2008, uh, and again in 2012. In this regard, however, President Obama has followed the rhetorical script of every Democrat who has occupied the White House in the post-civil rights era. But he's also done something very different. What makes President Obama's racial word politics so unique is his bold, confident use of his personal history and even the person of his own body to explain and defend his vision of America as a liberal, multicultural body politic. Mr. Obama's suggestive metaphor seared into my genetic makeup does both rhetorical and political work. In a way, the shock of the image creates a moment, however fleeting, in which the listener can see his or her own individual body, not just as a reflection of, but as an embodied repository of our collective political identity and hopes as Americans. Mr. Obama has insisted on more than one occasion that it would be a mistake to view his presidency as heralding the arrival of a post-racial society. We should take him at his word or find another word that captures the full significance of what the age of Obama means for the future of American race politics. Hmm. I'm lost here in the text now. One of the most puzzling aspects of our national word politics is the stubborn persistence of a kind of black 
racial exceptionalism in the stories we have made up and passed on throughout our history about the nature and meaning of American citizenship. The peculiar place of black political experience and black political identity, uh, which I should say um, is not the whole, but just a part of the larger um, experience of race in this country. But the, the peculiar place of black political experience and black political identity in the civic tells we tell ourselves about belonging to America, in Kenneth Carr's memorable phrase, is perhaps most clearly revealed in the different ways we think and talk about two concepts, the concept of race on one hand and the concept of identity on the other. The official story, to quote the late Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell, is that the United States is, as Powell put it in the Baki case, a nation of minorities, each of whom has had to struggle to overcome the prejudices of a majority that was itself composed of various minorities. The actual record, however, suggests that the story of American political community is considerably more complicated. Even when we have not acknowledged it, Americans have always understood through a kind of common sense that the history and language of race are the history and language of chattel slavery, forced convict labor, lynching, and Jim Crow segregation. As we most often tell it, the history and language of ethnicity in this country are by contrast the history and language of immigration and the myths of Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty, and the American melting pot. We conveniently forget the fact that for most of US history, this nation's immigration law regime expressly denied the right of citizenship to immigrants from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East until the passage of the landmark Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, whose 50th anniversary we'll celebrate next year, the story of American ethnicity was a story about coming and belonging to a white America. US immigration law and policy have served as a crucial political tool for fixing and enforcing the border, if you will, between race and ethnicity. In short, the ethnic state has always also operated as a racial state. This story of the different and divergent meanings of race and ethnicity is a story then of a fundamental and enduring political contradiction. Even when black people have been formally acknowledged as citizens of the United States of America, as members of the nation state, they have never been fully or unequivocally accepted as Americans, as members of the country we call them America. Barack Obama's success as a professional politician has turned in no small part on his keen sense of the symbolic dimensions of politics, the politics of de depiction, portrayal, image, and representation, in which the way that people imagine themselves occupies a central place. His talent and temperament, and the times, have uniquely positioned Mr. Obama to see and tap into a broad yearning in this country for fresh civic myths and new national narratives about what belonging to America means at the dawn of the 21st century. Marshalling and mixing personal autobiography, family chronicles, and tales of political kinship, this son of a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas has written, or better, enacted a story that centers and celebrates the post-civil rights vision of America as a liberal, multicultural society. Through a strategic, categorical mis miscegenation, the politician who has famously called himself a mutt found a way to weave the stories, images, and legends of ethnicity and race into a new American dream narrative that ethnicizes race and racializes ethnicity. In an act of what Daniel Patrick Moynihan once called semantic infiltration, Barack Obama has fused race and ethnicity and mobilized people around a personality politics through the talk of the dream which has been seared into his body. He's spoken of a people, uh, of Americans uh, as a people who've scratched and clawed their way to get into a piece of the American dream, of the many who didn't make it because they'd been defeated by discrimination and the generations for whom this legacy of defeat was all the black experience in America had bequeathed them. Barack Obama, son of Kenya and Kansas, offered up the image of his body as a kind of crossroads for the immigrant and the slave stories. 
For the first time in the history of presidential politics, the two bodies of the president, the two bodies of the American story merged symbolically in one. After Mr. Obama, there now exists an emerging, if still contested, common sense in this country that black identities like white or brown or yellow identities are as much about ethnicity, common culture and experience as they are about race, skin and bones and blood. The post-Obama post ethnic race narrative has created a cultural space in which a large segment of the American public has begun to experiment with new ways of thinking and talking about the politics of race. In the White House years, the liberal multicultural ethnic race narrative that Mr. Obama forged as a candidate has shaped President Obama's ongoing campaign to persuade black Americans that they can only hope to heal our old racial wounds by binding our particular grievances to the larger aspirations of all Americans, the white woman struggling to break the glass ceiling, the white man who has been laid off, the immigrant trying to feed his family. These are his words. Much has been written about the consumer marketing or the political marketing strategy the Obama operation devised during his campaign for the presidency. Building out the candidate's already outsized personality politics, Mr. Obama's ideas, his identity, and his image were packaged and pushed as a high-end corporate brand. Uh, the White House Social Secretary, uh, the first White House Social Secretary, Ms. Desiree Rogers, boasted to the Wall Street Journal after the election, we have the best brand in the world, the Obama brand. The concept of ethnic race was a crucial component of the Obama brand experience. First mainstream African American, or in the words of uh, Senator Biden, articulate, bright, clean, and a nice looking guy. Despite the administration's public disavowals, David Axelrod famously said, the president is a person, not a product. The political marketing that defined Mr. Obama's bid for the White House has also been a hallmark of his governance style. I don't think any president has appeared on network, particularly late night television, as much as Barack Obama since he was elected. Mr. Obama's presidential branding campaign actually began before the election during an early 2008 interview. Mr. Obama declared his, his admiration for what he called the transformational presidency of Ronald Reagan, praising the sense of dynamism and entrepreneurship, these are his words, that Mr. Reagan brought to the job. Now, the professed romance with the godfather of political neoliberalism sent a clear signal to the powers that be. An Obama White House would do nothing to challenge the dominance of the neoliberal corporate market state model of presidential power established by Mr. Reagan and continued by his, his successors, Republican and Democrat uh, alike. Even though he assumed office at the height of a global financial crisis, President Obama and the economic elite who advise him have not strayed from the neoliberal playbook that guided the political makeover of the post-war welfare capitalist uh, state into the corporate post-industrial financial complex of today's market state. In the Philadelphia race speech, Mr. Obama railed against the special interests in Washington, the shuttered mills, the glut of foreclosed homes for sale, and the corporations that have shipped American jobs for nothing more than a profit. More than five years since he moved into the Oval Office, Mr. Obama has yet to acknowledge in any deep way the contradiction between his pre-presidential attacks on corporate power and the corporate brand management style that has characterized his tenure as chief executive of Democracy Incorporated, to invoke Sheldon Wolin's vivid image, the managed democracy of the neoliberal corporate market state. And I say this uh, mindful of his recent turn uh, to the language of inequality and the, uh, uh, the stump thumping um, that has gone on in recent months. Like his predecessors, President Obama has used the powers of the presidency to support and defend the continued political dominance of the neoliberal economic order. 
But he's gone further, investing considerable energy and effort to extend the reach and power of what might be called cultural neoliberalism as opposed to economic neoliberalism. If neoliberal governance politics seeks to maintain the power and prerogatives of the market regulated state, Neoliberal cultural politics aim to, aims to remake the whole of society in the image of the market. Its agenda, to quote John Berger, is to cultivate popular consent to and build a cultural consensus around a view of the world in which everything and everybody can be reduced to a calculation of profit that can be packaged, promoted, and sold, purchased, and consumed. The late cultural critic Stuart Hall has observed that one hallmark of the neoliberal political economies Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan imposed in the UK and US was a high threshold of tolerance for inconsistency and incoherence. Reagan and Thatcher both appreciated and mastered the purely rhetorical and symbolic work of politics, spinning webs of words to paper over the deep contradiction between the theory and practices of neoliberalism, reframing and reworking them rhetorically. Barack Obama is the first US president in the neoliberal era whose background, politics, professed values and ideals, and personal skills have uniquely positioned him to sell neoliberal programs and policies, deregulation, privatization, austerity, unemployment, corporate bailouts, and the like to a group of Americans whose lives, families, and communities have been disproportionately ra ravaged and deracinated by the social decimation, the cultural deprivation, and the economic devastation that has accompanied the rise of the neoliberal state. Retooling the consumer marketing model that put it in the White House, the Obama Organization has mobilized the ethnic race brand image and the personal brand of the president himself to promote a new ideological politics, racial neoliberalism. If Ronald Reagan was our first neoliberal president, Barack Obama is our first black neoliberal president. Um, I start to say, if Ronald Reagan was our first neoliberal president and Bill Clinton was our first black president, as Toni Morrison <laughs> called him, we could say that Barack Obama is our first black neoliberal president. Like the larger neoliberal project it legitimates, the racial neoliberal order over which President Obama has presided continues and consolidates the economization of American politics, but in a different color. Race has always been a foundational feature of capitalism, but racial neoliberalism is racial capitalism on steroids. The neoliberal brand management of race financializes and profitizes black civic publics and black political culture. Indeed, and even more decadently, racial neoliberalism marks and markets blackness itself as a political consumption good. The symbolic connection to the brutal marking of black bodies under slavery here is both ironic and uncanny. Racial neoliberalism exploits and increases the economic and political market value of race in today's ethno-racial moment. Consider the seamless corporate branding of diversity that the application of consumer marketing strategy has made possible for corporate America. At the same time that it consolidates and extends the political predominance of the market state, racial neoliberalism provides an ideological alibi which simultaneously hides and strengthens the economic order that maintains racial inequality. In short, we might say that Barack Obama's racial neoliberalism is neoliberal racism talking out of both sides of its mouth. Some have said that President Obama has turned the White House black. Uh, I hope to have shown in my brief remarks how and why that symbolic transformation, whose importance I do not want to deny as a feature of symbolic politics in America, because I deeply believe that symbolic politics matters. But I hope to have shown how and why that symbolic transformation cannot be separated from the broader term, the, the broader turn to and consolidation of neoliberalism. And this, notwithstanding this, the fact, as I said earlier, that the president has rediscovered the language of inequality that characterized his first uh, campaign. 
The programs and policies of the neoliberal corporate financial post-industrial complex have proven to be a nightmare, not only for black and brown Americans, but for poor and working class Americans of every race. The secret and scandal of the age of Obama is that the dream politics of a free, just, multicultural democratic future for every American has in many ways become an impossible dream. The tragedy, though, would be to believe with Du Bois that the political impossibility of black freedom under neoliberal racism is in the very nature of things. It is not. Another politics, indeed, another world is still possible. Thank you. I'll just do it from here. Wow, that's very eloquent. And I, um, I really couldn't agree more with the basic premises of what Kendall Thomas has said. So I'm just going to pose one question. Uh, I'll set it up with a couple remarks and then, then really like to open it up to all of you. Um, what you said about Obama as a high-end social brand uh, is absolutely uh, he certainly has done that. Um, two days before his election in 2008, he interrupted his campaign to go and visit the white mother of his white mother, who was dying. His grandmother, too. I mean, what can be... It's in him, as, as Kendall said, um, this kind of mix. But in addition to him scrambling some of this, um, you also allude to the fact that neoliberal capitalism is so absorptive and protein. It draws everything into itself and it makes a lot out of it. It is scrambling our racial and even our libidinal decks. It's very intrusive. It's very intimate. It affects how we perceive ourselves, the things we buy, the way we relate to each other through our work. And, you know, when, when affirmative action was up for a referendum in Washington State, you had defending affirmative action, you had Boeing and Microsoft and Starbucks, you know, the epitome of neoliberal capitalism, saying we're beyond, you know, we, we, we are willing to take account of race, to get beyond race and all of that. So I guess um, that leads to a question that I want to pose this way. Um, if you start to see, and I wrote, I, this came to me back when, um, there were a lot of black mayors being elected in the 1980s, and Colin Powell was rising as a military man. And I wrote, to watch black Americans running municipalities and military machines and even money markets, multinational corporations, Richard Parson, Time Warner, to watch that is to watch the angels of blackness withdraw along with the demons in the white imagination. It is to surrender both condescension and sentimentality and contempt. This is disorienting because it's absolutely true that whites have, first of all, abducted and plunged into this country millions of African Americans who, who therefore, by virtue of what happened, had the deepest stake possible in this country living up to its stated promises, right? And they became some became the most eloquent exponents of that, and some became most, the most nihilist assailants because of the bitterness, the, the, the whole nature of what happened. And now we have this situation where neoliberal capitalism is scrambling all that, and Obama embodies that scrambling. His own history is idiosyncratic. So I guess my question is, given this thing that we're passing through on race, is there a way to for race, race identity, and racial consciousness to be the springboard of a new politics, or are we trapped saying, I am excluded, therefore I am, that my identity comes only from the fact of exclusion? Um, how do we balance this in a time when so many forces are actually producing Obamas at the same time that they're producing the economic and inequality undertoes that, as you're right, he's only late, lately mentioned. 
So it's a question about racial identity as a springboard of, of a new politics. <clears throat> well, thank you for that question. Um, it's uh, an important and difficult question to which I don't claim to have any full or final answer. I think what I would say as a starting point is that it's very important to me at least um, to distinguish between racial politics or anti-racist politics on the one hand and racial identity on the, on the other. Uh, there is a fine and continuing tradition in this country of a coalition politics, of an anti-racist coalitional politics, um, which is not premised on and does not posit a common racial identity, but starts from the recognition of a shared or linked faith in the words of Michael Dawson, right? because um, it takes as one of its central insights the ways in which the costs of racism right, have been borne by people of all colors seriously. Right? Right? So the injuries of racism, the harms of racism are not limited to those at whom racism is directed. Right? There's always um, and always has been a kind of collateral damage um, of the humanity, if you will, uh, of white Americans uh, that is not always acknowledged. Right? So for me, a progressive anti-racist politics is a politics that, start with, that starts with that recognition of um, race as a political category. Lonnie Guineer and Gerald Torres in their book uh, call it political race. And I have in my own work uh, tried to elaborate a political conception of racial justice which centers the idea of the effects of racism on vulnerable racial publics. Right? And the harm to our democracy, if democracy is a word we want to use to describe our political system, the harms to the legitimacy of the American liberal democratic order, right? of the exclusion, the systematic exclusion, marginalization, right? um, and disempowerment of vulnerable racial publics. Now, we live in a moment when much of the form, if not the content of racism, takes place through the deployment of discourses and the advancements of policies which themselves have nothing to do with race. Right? Uh, so consider, if you will, the mobilization around the country, which has led to an explosion of lawsuits and the like around voter ID laws, right? um, challenges to um, preclearance under the Voting Rights Act, which the Supreme Court of the United States has weakened enormously, the continuing costs for black and brown communities in this country of the felony disfranchisement regime, right? And the limits in North Carolina and many other places throughout the, the country on the exercise of the franchise represented by such things as the attack on early um, uh, voting, on Sunday voting, um, absentee voting, registration at the polls and, and, and the like. So just even within the restricted realm of electoral politics, um, which one might have thought uh, after the civil rights settlement was a matter 
whose integrity we all agreed on. Right? Uh, we have seen what seems to me to be um, the, a state of affairs that calls for the um, reassertion right, of the importance of race, understood again politically, right, and in terms of a coalitional politics, the reassertion of race as a central feature of the democratic deficit that affects the entire spectrum right. Right, of American life. So I'm trying to, can I use the word integrate? Um, to, to, to integrate um, an analysis that focuses on the value and integrity of preserving racial publics, right? Um, but which lets go of the kinds of thinking uh, that has come to be associated with the notion of racial identity. So, so it's like racial identity is being reimposed, but by people who are claiming, oh, we're not, we're just passing voter identification. We're right, just, by people who are claiming to be blind and who on the Supreme Court are arguing that they are the true um, inheritors of the legacy of Brown versus the Board of Education, even as um, they're consolidating on the court in constitutional terms um, the decimation of public education and the continuing exclusion of black and also brown uh, school children to access to uh, one of the institutions in our country whose importance for forging civic identity, consciousness, and literacy has been crucial. Um, Just one more point and then we should open up. Um, I, this is not even, I'm agreeing with you. I, it's a good basis for coalitional politics because a lot of what they're imposing under colorblind rules, supposedly in quotes, um, is really, they're really screwing a lot of white people also who are really going to, at least potentially, one would like to think, uh, become part of a coalitional politics. That's a longer discussion right. and uh, it doesn't uh, contest anything you're saying. So, On Yeah, that's point? absolutely true. Just think of Detroit. Just take the example yeah. of Detroit. Um, I was driving up here this morning and um, Amy Goodwin, had a segment on Democracy Now! of interviews uh, with people who are organizing in Detroit. This was after a segment on the continuing and um, tragic uh, events in Ferguson and the admirable um, critical resistance to it. But Amy Goodman had a segment on, I was stunned, I had not known about this, um, the courts have approved the denial of water right, by the city of Detroit to people who are in arrears on their water bills. Right. So we are arguing in the United States, in the United States, about the right to water, a question that we normally think is relevant in human rights terms only to the global south. In Detroit, um, one of what my friend Cornell West likes to call our chocolate cities, right? And I think that's that's that kind and um, poor whites, obviously, uh, have suffered greatly as a result of this political decision. But the indifference nationally to what's going on in Detroit um, can be traced, I think, in some significant part to the fact that Detroit represents Blackness. in the national imagination, or at least in the white national imagination, yeah. a racial colony, yes. right? Even though we all know that Detroit is also the name of um, a rich history that helped build a white middle class in that part of the country. So the decimation in the large cities of, of Michigan, uh, which is about neoliberalism, right, um, has become depoliticized largely because of the sheer taken for grantedness that it's not 
a problem that ought to engage the national attention because it's happening to black people. So at this point, is my mic working? Yeah. yeah. Um, at this point, um, I think we're going to take some questions. I have a few comments, but I want to save them because I, I really want to hear from the rest of you. Um, please raise your hands high. Um, and I'm hoping I can, I'll, I'll take care of this part. Um, and I'm hoping that, um, that again, you'll address the very points that were put on the table, but also the title of um, the conference, what is racial justice? Um, and what's, what is its relationship to democracy? The very first hand was right here in front. Please wait for the mic. Um, hi. Hi. Um, my question is, in your opinion, what do you think racial injustice and President Obama has to do with young black Negroes in today's society? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's a great question. Do, sh should we, I, I sort of like to- Hear a few? Hear a few, and that, okay. that, that makes us have a conversation. Okay, terrific. So right. can I see a few more hands? Uh, yes, in the back of the room, please. Thank you very much. Uh, this would be directed towards uh, Kendall Thomas for his comments. Uh, he used uh, W.E.B. Du Bois as a reference point. Uh, the, uh, and also what uh, Jim Sleeper had said about the neoliberal, the neoliberal uh, uh, dusting off of uh, and consolidation of, of the black image as, uh, in, their, in their vision and to be used in their vision. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, 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 connection with socialism, mm -hmm. communism, socialism, and the red baiting, the vicious red baiting that he had to endure during his time. And now it's completely, you know, that's all past. And everyone of anyone that refers to black history in the United States refers to W.E.B. Du Bois as just sort of a neutral with regards to that. And he was very significant in those areas, and he withstood a tremendous amount of, of opposition. And I wonder what uh, uh, Kendall Thomas has to say about that. Maybe, uh, yes, on this side of the room, please. Do we have a mic on that side of the room? Okay. No, don't throw it. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how you're going to weave this into the, the, the discussion, but I'd be very uh, curious to know, Professor Thomas, about your views on a majority minority districts. Because on the one hand, I think you could argue that politically in different states, they have actually led white America to be able to marginalize uh, uh, the black vote, even dismiss it, its importance by just packing so many uh, blacks into one district. On the other hand, uh, I think they've been culturally very, very important in, in, in letting uh, black leaders emerge. So I don't know, uh, do you feel conflicted about those districts? And, and if so, which, which, which way do you fall? I'm gonna take one more down here. Uh, yes, thank you. And then maybe we'll get the conversation going. Good afternoon. Um, I was listening to um, your speech about um, the pre-justice of us, and I want to ask, could you tell me the definition of neoliberal, if you can, because I've, I heard it a lot, and I just want to know what the definition is. Okay. It's a good question. Great. Very good question. Um, all right. Um, Jim, I hope you'll jump in here. Um, feel absolutely free to do so. Okay, so what do um, questions of racial justice and what does um, the Obama administration um, have to do with Negro youth? Great question. And I'm going to answer it by going back to this morning's radio show. One, I don't drive very much because I live in New York, um, but one of the things I love about driving when I do it is that I get to listen to the radio, uh, which I simply don't have time to do. And it's been very instructive driving up each morning, each of the two mornings of this conference, because I've learned a lot. Yesterday, there was an extraordinary 
uh, segment on the journalist Gary Webb, who's the subject of a new film with the actor Jeremy Renner. He's the, um, the writer who broke the story um, in the San Jose Mercury Journal, I think it was called, uh, in the 90s about um, the CIA's knowledge and indifference to drug dealing, um, specifically cocaine dealing by uh, the Contras in Nicaragua, which uh, had a lot to do with the explosion of the devastating crack epidemic in, in black communities um, in the 80s and 90s. So um, I would urge all of the students in the room, listen to the radio and read the newspapers, right? Um, you will learn at least as much, if not more, from doing that on a daily basis as you're learning uh, in your classes. Actually, it will enrich the learning uh, that you're doing in your classes. So anyway, um, the question. Um, the segment, one of the segments was an interview with young people your age and a little bit older um, who live in and around Ferguson, Missouri, uh, and who are um, mobilizing uh, to resist the over-policing, uh, the deadly over-policing, as we know from the killing of Michael Brown, of their communities. And um, one of these young people said something which just hurt my heart. Um, he said, um, I don't feel very American being tear gassed. Right? It was predominantly young people on, on the streets in, Flor in, in, in Ferguson. And um, another of the young people who were being interviewed by Ms. Goodman said um, that a lot of the actual protests, because the young people, I guess they feel um, that they're at risk um, protesting in Ferguson, but a lot of the protests have shifted to a town that's very close to Ferguson called Florissant. And Florissant is um, the location of the cemetery in which Dred Scott is buried. Do you all know the name Dred Scott? Uh, Dred Scott was a plaintiff in a very important uh, Supreme Court decision, 19th century Supreme Court decision in 1857, which some people say started the Civil War. Uh, and Dred Scott sued for his freedom because his master had taken him from a slave state to a free territory. And the Supreme Court denied um, his claim on the grounds that he belonged to a race of people with respect to whom um, the universal opinion among the civilized world had been that they had no rights, which the, black, which the white man was bound to respect, right? Um, so it was a case in which even the right to have rights um, was denied and which some say um, precipitated the Civil War. So Dred Scott is buried in Florissant where these, where these protests are going on today. And what I thought was so um, moving and what gave me hope um, was the way in which the critical resistance of these young people to the policing of black communities in that part of the country was informed by a critical analysis which was alert to the continuities, to the historical continuities between the very different um, historical moments of 1857 and 2014, right? Uh, they weren't saying it's just the same, nothing has changed, they weren't saying that but they were saying that their analysis of the situation they faced and the decisions they had made about the direct democracy uh, in the streets that they had chosen as a strategy of political resistance were informed by an understanding of the continuities as well as the discontinuities between our moment um, and that of Dred Scott. So uh, Lauren Hill um, has just posted uh, a song set to the tune of My Favorite Things, the Rodgers and Hammerstein song from uh, The Sound of Music, uh, about the kinds of rage uh, that young black people in this country can rightly feel, but which they should channel into productive um, and to pacific uh, demands for political change and transformation. 
So um, these young people were upset with Mr. Obama because he sent Eric Holder in right, uh, as the voice of reason to um, mediate uh, in the context of the Ferguson affair. And yet he said, and then he quits. Right? So the kind of symbolic politics that I was criticizing that uh, I associate with the Obama administration, I think has a lot to do with the promise and possibility of this new anti-racist movement uh, of which uh, the mobilization in Ferguson is a part. Du Bois and social democracy. Well, um, Du Bois was red baited and the questioner said, that's all past. Um, but you know, racism has no fixed propositional content, right? Uh, it can use different kinds of discourses to, um, um, to operate ideologically and politically uh, in the same or similar way. So I would suggest to you that a lot of the work uh, that the charges that because Du Bois was communist, he was not American did uh, during his time uh, has been done by the absolute uh, refusal in the face of all the rational evidence to the contrary uh, to see Mr. Obama as an American, right? Uh, the birther movement, right? Um, this idea that he's a Muslim, as um, one woman famously, uh, no, he's an Arab, uh, I think one woman famously said uh, to John McCain uh, during the 2000 Aid campaign. So I think we're dealing here with sort of traveling um, uh, racisms, right, which attach to different terms, but which do something of the same ideological work in these different historical moments. Um, on majority minority districts, I would agree with you. I think they are important, they have been empowering, and they have actually made a difference. Uh, they have at the same time made white politicians and uh, many white citizens uh, think that in those districts which are not majority minority districts that uh, they can without costs be indifferent to or affirmatively hostile to uh, the aspirations of African Americans and uh, other Americans of color and to the racial publics to which they and um, enlightened um, white American citizens belong. But I would say that it's important to defend um, majority minority districts, even as we recognize the importance of electoral politics, notwithstanding that electoral politics is not enough, right? And this is where um, I think uh, it's important to um, understand the limitations of liberal democracy, right, which focuses on individuals right, uh, rather than groups, uh, and which sees the problem of racism that uh, it is our charge to address in purely individualistic terms. Right? Um, so I just happen to be black. I'm discriminated against because someone is prejudiced. Hannah Arendt subscribed to this understanding of racism. Racism is simply a kind of moral cognitive error, right, in which I fail to um, apprehend and therefore to appreciate the equal um, moral personhood of, of fellow Americans because of the accident of uh, the color of their skin, right? Uh, so race is understood is reduced to skin color and then effectively dismissed as meaningless. And um, I want to defend liberal democracy because it has never been more besieged. At the same time, um, I want to say that liberal democracy and an understanding of politics and the primary side of politics as taking place within the institutions of the state and through voting is not enough. It's necessary but not a sufficient condition for the racial democracy uh, that I believe we can and must fight for in this country. Um, I am a social democrat, and so I believe with every fiber of my being uh, that racial justice in this country will not 
be achieved in any real or meaningful sense unless and until we understand that alongside um, equal political and civil rights, even as they are being attacked, uh, we must have uh, a recognition of the full social citizenship, the full economic citizenship, uh, and the full cultural citizenship of Americans of color in the, in the United States. And only social democracy can give us that because it realizes that the primary site of racism is not uh, formal legal exclusion, right? uh, but that powerful aggregations of private power, what the Supreme Court calls societal discrimination, a form of discrimination, by the way, with which it is not concerned, right? um, are motors of racial um, stigmatization, stratification, and exclusion in this country. Um, the Supreme Court is likely to take up a case, for example, um, about the Housing Rights Act and whether or not a good claim can be made out under that federal legislation of housing discrimination through the presentation of, at, of evidence of racially disparate treatment. Right? That's not intentional. And it is entirely possible that the Supreme Court will, in effect, constitutionalize by reading into statutory uh, law the requirement of intentional purposeful action that it is read into uh, our 14th Amendment jurisprudence and making it even harder for um, plaintiffs seeking redress under the Housing Act to make out a case of racial discrimination. Right? So uh, there are, um, even, even if within the realm of legal protections, right? Um, within the realm of the anti-discrimination model that has organized so much of liberal democratic thinking about what racism is, um, we are, I think, um, turning our back on the rich legacy of the Civil Rights Act. So on the question of uh, what neoliberalism is, neoliberalism started out as an economic philosophy um, at whose center was a kind of free market fundamentalism. And the promotion in the realm of economic uh, philosophy of um, a kind of financialization of our economy right? and an understanding um, of our political economy, of our economic uh, policy, which more or less took the view that what's good for corporate, uh, what's good for corporate America is good for America, or that um, corporate America ought to be the driver and the primary um, um, focus of our economic policy. Right? Um, so deregulation, uh, privatization, um, neoliberalism started out uh, as an, econo an economic policy that was applied to the global south. Right? So as a condition of receiving aid, uh, countries had to submit to a whole host of policies that were forged um, at the IMF and the World Bank of austerity, privatization, and the like and could not pursue um, social democratic policies such as uh, the, uh, the, 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 the possession as a national uh, resource of um, oil, uh, gas, minerals, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the basic idea here um, is deregulation, um, the privatization of social uh, 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 goods, and as we saw during the crisis, uh, a, a, a calculus in which uh, profits are privatized and losses are socialized, right? So that we carried, right, um, and internalized uh, the externalities, as economists say, of the bad um, decisions and the, the ridiculous risks uh, that the banks took uh, that led to uh, the Great Recession. So this, this idea um, that government and government actors ought 
to march to the tune of Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, right? Um, who are writing statutes and regulations because they have bought uh, access to our politicians. That is the heart, uh, for me, of, of neoliberalism, um, in which everything, including politicians and policy, can be bought and sold. We used to, we used to use the phrase political market, political marketplace as a kind of metaphor, uh, mostly in the context of the First Amendment, uh, but that metaphor is now real, right? And so the idea that there's a separation between the market, the state, and civil society has been um, eroded. Uh, some people would say irreparably. And it bespeaks a kind of totalitarianism, right? Because this idea of distinct spheres of the society, each of which were governed by um, their own norms, is under assault um, with the rise and um, the hegemony of neoliberalism. Um, I'm happy to talk with you more about this uh, after the session. There are other people in the audience who have been on or will be on one of these panels who could probably have given a much better uh, definition and description of neoliberalism than I've given to you. But that, that, that's where I'd start. And so I'd say um, that people of color have been um, set up to drink the Kool-Aid of neoliberalism, right? So that, for example, we uh, think that it is a massive and important civil rights issue um, that uh, Barney's has discriminated against a young man who bought a $395 Faragamo belt, right? So that, that, that becomes, um, um, you know, a primary conductor of our political energies when we've got um, other problems like incarceration, private uh, detention centers for immigrants, et cetera, which are affecting much larger numbers of people. Uh, neoliberalism um, is also, I think, in terms of its symbolic politics, uh, characterized by a state of affairs in which our celebrities don't march alongside our civil society leaders and politicians, as Harry Belafonte and Lena Horne and Sammy Davis uh, and others did during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, but they actually become the face of civil rights advocacy. So we look to Jay-Z to broker a deal uh, with Barney's um, over these charges of discrimination against young consumers of color. And young people um, are invited to see themselves in the image of Jay-Z as consumers uh, for whom what matters is not their rights as citizens, uh, but their participation in the bling-bling economy. That's neoliberalism. Um, that's cultural neoliberalism um, on steroids, right? Um, I'll, can, I'll stop can, I, can we get one more question? We have one more question. It would have to be a very, according to Roger, and I agree, it would have to be a very brief question. Um, do we have any? And Jim Sleeper will answer. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> yes, right there behind you, his laptop. So, um, social, de social democracy seems to make sense as an opposition to stratification. Mm -hmm. Racial justice can be articulated in opposition to segregation. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about the relationship, if uh, there's a time in American political thought where people thought about the opposition to stratification and segregation as more connected than they are today. More connected than they actually are today? Yeah, well, today sometimes those, are, those can be framed as separate concerns. That stratification maybe perhaps refers more to class or to, I don't know, uh, the caste system characteristic of the Magna Carta, whereas right. segregation, people think of uh, Jim Crow law. Right. Well, I mean, you can have segregation without formal law, right? Um, we have that in Brazil, right? And uh, there are some who say we have it today. I mean, there, there are large communities of people of color in this country who are effectively isolated from and cut off from the rest of the American society. Um, I said yesterday, I think this fact is, is, is correct, that some 90% uh, of black students who attend public schools attend schools in which the vast majority of the other students in the school 
are also black, right? So um, we are not living in an era of formal legal exclusion, which is race specific, and yet uh, Michelle Alexander and others, I think uh, in many ways rightly, have called our attention to the ways in which uh, the social exclusion that characterizes so much of the life of people of color in this country today deserves to be called the new Jim Crow. Right? And in this regard, uh, America has become, uh, in some important respects like Brazil, which never had um, a regime of explicitly racialized exclusion, but by virtue of cultural and social norms right, um, and practices uh, of institutional racism, which was not codified as law, maintained a racial hierarchy in which those persons who were the beneficiaries of white skin privilege were also the beneficiaries of economic privilege and the like. I think that tight connection um, no longer exists. There's a loosening, right? And we see in the immiseration of large segments of the white working class uh, how um, the bargain that poor and working class whites made with white elites um, to accept their class position in exchange for the cultural capital of white racial reputation, people aren't, more and more people are saying, you know, we don't like that deal. We want to renegotiate the, the, the racial contract. Um, and I see that as a space, right, uh, for social democratic coalitional politics. Uh, and we're seeing it going on in North Carolina with Moral Mondays. We, we're seeing it with the Dream Defender movement um, in Florida around immigration. Uh, so um, I want Gramsci um, once uh, urged pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will, right? I want to suggest to you that you ought to be critical about what's going on and, and, and don't drink the Kool-Aid, which says that we have overcome, we have not, uh, but optimistic that through the collective and um, dedicated um, work of organizing and mobilizing and demanding change um, that we can usher in um, a vision of our common life in which, as the South African Freedom Charter of 1955 uh, said, um, I'm paraphrasing, um, for the American situation, America belongs to all the America belongs to all the people who live in it. That is currently not the case, but it could be.